Today, the 29th of July, and we're in Watkinsville at the Oconee County branch of the Public Library. And would you tell me your name, sir? My name is Robert Henry Brown. Thank you very much. Um, would you tell me a little something of your experiences during the area, the era, 50 years ago of the World War II? Yes, I was graduating from college in this kind of thing, and my first job uh, involved uh, a college assignment, which, interestingly enough, tied me into electronics. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer, and uh, airborne electronics is my specialty. And as soon as I got there, it seemed like they needed someone to teach some signal corps trainees at night. So I got involved with the, with the military effort early, even though I was still civilian teaching. But I do believe that identified my name along because it wasn't too long. In fact, two months after Elaine and I were married in 1942, <laughs> two months, two months later, I got my little card to say they sent me to Harvard to study electronics, have one electronics, and from there to MIT. They were really giving it to me fast, but fortunately I, I enjoyed it. And I felt very fortunate. And I knew that I needed to have this ability so that I could pay back. And we needed this effort. I was ticketed uh, in the Navy for airborne electronics, which meant my service would be on aircraft carriers. And I, I, I must say that aircraft carrier is an exciting place, uh, particularly at night when the aircraft have to take off and land and there you are, you know. And my, my experience was, of course, uh, with the airplane electronics. My duty station was in the ready room, so I knew all the pilots by first name, this is good and bad, because when they didn't return, it, it hurt more. Wonderful friendships formed. But, you know, I, I set up a, a, a challenging signal when the aircraft left the carry on the takeoff, and if their identification equipment wasn't working, I, I, I challenged it, it really didn't bother them if it was, they had to come back. And they were, air, 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 pilots don't like to return, they like to go. But when their IFF identification friend or foe, when IFF equipment wasn't working properly, I let them know and they came back. So they're very cooperative, very much so. It's difficult when they don't come back, uh, it's difficult when you bring in the men, uh, and, and they land and, and skid around and hurt things. All, all of these are very difficult. But we, we searched submarines in the Atlantic for, oh, about, I don't know, six or eight months. We, we sank one <laughs> and saw some others and ran away. Uh, we, we're not a, we had one five-inch gun. Our airplanes were our weapon. So when they were not uh, effective why, and the water was rough, not much you could do. So then we moved uh, to cover the, the submarine effort that might be after our shipping <clears throat> during the Normandy invasion. <clears throat> we did that, oh, about six weeks, I guess, before and after. And following that, we went into the Mediterranean because the southern France thing was probably on somebody's long-range ticket. So I saw the most beautiful water I've ever seen in my life in the Mediterranean. You could actually see the propellers of the ships down below the water. You could see the fish swimming in the water. So different from the Atlantic, so calm and beautiful. You wouldn't believe that there was going to be some scrambling going on, but we had it in North Africa, and we were able to help some. And we were preparing really for the Southern France invasion, and they sent me to a, a British uh, wooden ship I had never been on one before, but being communications, we had to, they said, got to know you blokes. So, so we were together in, uh, on a wooden ship in the Mediterranean for a while, quite an experience. Um, then the Southern France thing came and we had a few airplanes to shoot down and very close calls by torpedoes and this kind of thing. And we sank two German submarines in the Mediterranean. And you don't like to, don't like to battle them because you can't see them. <laughs> they can see you somehow. So that's an interesting thing. And coming back from that then when this southern France thing was over and essentially the war in Europe was cooling down, 
um, they moved us to the Japanese, to the Asia area. I had been through the canal, the Panama Canal, twice, I guess. This was the third time. Going in the wrong direction, though. I was leaving all my, my friends and my wife and all this. And the Japanese war was very different. The Japanese had a very strong navy. The Germans did not. They were submarines. But surface ships in <coughs> surface ships in the in the Pacific Ocean were our enemy, and we we worked out of Guam and out of Ulithi, go in and stay a while and not too long because too many ships gathered too long. Torpedoes started coming in, and they always had a mind. You had to search that before you went in. It was an interesting thing. We we were able to use our technology to predicted and to locate it and fortunately our ship were very very close and we were rocked a couple of times by explosions other ships didn't get the message and it's very frightening but you still learned how to sleep and best you could and we knew we had a job to do and our aircraft did it for us we were in two engagements where there was intense uh, aircraft Fighter, fight, fighter to fighter opposition. But we we came out of it fine, and after that was over, they they flew me back to the country and sent me to Corpus Christi to operate a program down there. The war wasn't over there at that time, but almost. I didn't know it was. We didn't know when it was going to end. Um, but I, I feel very fortunate to have been able to serve my country in, a, in an unusual way, really, because there wasn't too many of us. I was just fortunate, and it was it was an experience that I, I shall always remember. Close friendships. Oh, when you have these close friendships. And I, I had a lot of, of airborne electronics technicians. I was, I was always with the men. And that was my number one number one look see because they did the job. They we, we we conversed and I gave the guidance as best I could, but they did the actual going in and fixing and going in. Excellent relationship. I remember when one fell overboard, <laughs> one, of, one of my act, act, F1 technicians, and we had to, the, we always had two or three destroyers with us. They pick them up, we don't stop. They, and they picked them up. But they never return a fella to the carrier until almost Sunday. And at that time, the flight exercises were over, and everyone gathered on the flight deck of the carrier, and here comes this technician. They, they shot the line across, and he gets in this little, looks like a bucket seat that you ride in a baby now. <laughs> there he comes riding across, oh, I guess about 100 feet away. And the, it would go up and down as the ships move up and down, and they were all chair whenever he'd get his feet wet. It was quite an exciting thing. You see, we made uh, a, a pleasant, enjoyable experience kidding about a, an unfortunate fellow who <laughs> fell overboard, so to speak. But I, I enjoyed that, that part very much, and, and fortunately, uh, we didn't lose too many people. It's hard when you lose your pilot and all because I was quite close to them. But uh, we didn't pick them up. They were picked up otherwise. And didn't have to go through that. But it, I guess I, I, I would say that the friendships formed and, and the experience gained was much more than I was able to get. Was there um, a particular time during those years that that stood out for you? Yes, I guess uh, I, I was, I went in as an ensign and when I was promoted to lieutenant, I guess that was, that stood out for me because I had some friends that thought that I had done a better job than I had and I was able to get promoted and, and when I was promoted, we happened to be in a on the west coast and my wife could come and see it and I was pleased pleased to see her <laughs> pleased that she could come I guess that stood out because of the little bit of recognition that you get um, in lieutenant it's ensign lieutenant JG lieutenant it's not so high but starting off with one stripe and going two I had one and a half and then two well, was a big deal you know uh, and after the war I have stayed in the reserve I'm retired reserve now, but I did stay in the reserve and I was able to set up uh, electronics training here in Athens and in Atlanta. And um, 
I wrote the guidelines for airborne electronics training for for the southeast area air, air, air people. And that was a challenge, and but it kept me going, and I finally worked up to four stripes. So at that time, I was a CO, commanding officer, of a four-stripe captain. That's, you, know, you understand? And, then, and so I've been very fortunate. I feel I didn't earn any of these. They just sort of hand them to you, and they feel like you're doing all right. But I enjoyed it. And I, I speak highly for the Navy. Were there uh, some ports of call you preferred to others? Was, were some tours of duty tougher than others? Yeah, much. The, the uh, by all means, the, the Atlantic, much to be preferred. Whatever port of call you had in the Atlantic Ocean was always more, more populated, more civilized, more, more like us. You know, after all, they did found America. So all, all of that, plus the, uh, the canal, the Panama Canal, and the West Coast is all right. But once you get out past Hawaii, uh, no, <laughs> no port calls. There's, there's just zero, you know, for us. So, uh, so I would say definitely, if I had to choose, you know, I'd take the Atlantic, even though the water's rough. Rough. I mean, when the wind blows, that thing is really rough. But the Pacific is so big, big, up and slowly. But, but there's just not, uh, not the habitation out there. So I didn't uh, really, other, other than Hawaii. Uh, Guam was all right, but but I, there's no real real uh, places to see that I was familiar with that that, that we enjoyed too much. And it wasn't too much time to enjoy. See, we were out on the water most of the time. Can you recall for me what it felt like to join up? Were you drafted or or, or enlist or or? Yes, I I did enlist, but I I enlisted so that I could be in the Navy in electronics. Uh, it was so selfish on my part. I, I knew when I joined, I, I went there and signed it to be, rather than to be drafted and assigned to whatever service. And I wanted to, to be in the Navy. Uh, I had an appointment at the Military Academy earlier and didn't go and I wanted my son to go to the Naval Academy, so that was another, another reason I was sort of pushing in that direction. But I, I, I do feel that the, the Navy has a very positive job opportunity. Always training, you're always training, you're always learning. And if you're not learning technical things and servicing things, you're, you're visiting all around, you travel. Well, the Navy has to go from here to yonder, you know, not too much uh, uh, inland, uh, you stay in water a lot. And so it, it's quite an experience and I, I, I appreciate it very much. Well, that answers your question, but... Uh. Um, do you remember the outbreak of war or the end of the war? Oh, yeah. I remember the, uh, the outbreak because I had, as I, as I mentioned, we, see, I was married in August and I had to go in November, <laughs> first part of November, so yes, I remember that part, uh, that, that call. But I, I don't remember, I remember everyone sitting around the radio and, uh, and listening very carefully, and in some places TV, but uh, that, they were more restricted then. You just had to go to special places to be able to see anything, you know. Um, but the end of the war, oh, I remember that. I was back in this country when the war ended, but we just had, oh, people stayed up all night and all day the next day and all, and I was at the Naval Air Station in uh, Rhode Island, in Providence, Rhode Island. And so I was ashore at the time, and people blowing horns, riding all over the place. They was cheering, and of course I lived in an area that had been developed for service people, the houses. And so everybody was out in the street, and the kids were out there running. They didn't know exactly what had happened. The, the children didn't, but they knew their family was happy, so they began to be happy. And they were clapping their hands and running around. I remember the little kids still. It was one. I didn't have any children at the time, but they sure were those families that were united and. And we on the possible place to be separated again. I was so happy to see that. It was just a joyful occasion, not only for yourself, but for those who were going to get to come home. What was it like communicating, writing letters, or, 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 or corresponding with your family while you were in the service? Made a world of difference. Made a lot of difference. Mail call, 
oh, mail call in the Navy was something. Of course, you realize that, that they, we had to, we were on the water. So wherever we hit a port, somehow, well, they knew. And, they, and they, the uh, mail was there. And it would be the first thing we'd do was send the uh, a boat, launch a boat to go in and pick up the mail, bring it out. And mail call was so unusual. And people would sit down, and sometimes there would be one or two who might not get a letter or a letter. Because you knew that, that they wanted one, you know, and, and, and it didn't come. Oh, the other letter was great. The people, well, those that I know, are so faithful and serious. Oh, my. And they made a lot of difference. Pictures. Oh, everybody had pictures running around. After mail call, you know, if you'd been out for, say, two or three months, or maybe even six months, and you hadn't had any mail calls for it. The pictures that was, were included, oh, photographs, made a lot of difference. Were there heroes that came out of that time oh, for yes, you, oh, or yes, villains? Oh yes, yes, sir. Zero. That the Japanese zeros were were uh, after us. Yes, and we had some. The latter, latter part of World War II, we had some very good fighters too. I, the Jap zero might have been a little better at first. Uh, I remember the first time we went to Pearl Harbor and came back. I was glad we did because we I don't believe we could make it with them. Speaking of Pearl Harbor, that's quite an experience. I, we were there fairly soon. The ships that they hit, they, they had pulled one out, but the others were still there. And it was, oh, it was really just sickening to go in and see how, how really banged up. They caught a lot of ships docked in Pearl Harbor. And it, you, you couldn't really get into some parts of it because of that still. And that, that, was, that was very, very interesting to me and very, uh, oh, it had hurried. You could see that here was war and you hadn't seen it before and there it was. Sure made a lot of difference. When we would anchor in the Pacific, I don't know how they did it, but the Japanese were quite, well, I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess you'd say they just, sort of good at things, you know? But they would leave bombs tied underneath and mines, you know, they'd mine the place. If they'd leave, they'd just mine the place. And, uh, and you were always worried about going in any sort of harbor. And that you had to sometimes go to a still water so you could repair some things and do these things, pick up mail, pick up supplies, do a whole lot of other things that they could reach you much better in, in some location like that. Um, Going back to Pearl Harbor later, when you when you had heard so much about it and you you see what they did to it, it really it really tore it up. The Japanese hit that pretty pretty solid. I think this is my next to last question. Um, can you tell me anything about electrical systems from your point of view um, as an electrical engineer? about the World War II. Can you tell um, someone who didn't know anything about electrical systems what you were working with in your work during those years? I'm not sure I understand. No, we were restricted in what we could say about, mm -hmm. yeah, we were very restricted about the rate of uh, the frequencies, what we were using, what our capabilities were, what the range was, you know, all of these things. No, that was, you just, didn't comment, uh, and the the uh, pilots and all when they came aboard, they had no idea what the frequencies were, what the equipment was like. It wasn't until they got in the ready room that they they got that message. And there was always a briefing uh, right before they left, and that's the first time they had heard where they were going and all this. So it was it was tighter tighter security than you think you'd have to have when you were sitting out that far away. But they they. Uh, you just couldn't talk, well, we were told at, at, uh, at MIT when we first started. Now, very few countries have the radar that we have. And then, you know, you just don't talk about it. You just say, well, I, I'm in radar. It, it's, we, we're working on it. But we had excellent equipment. Search equipment. And for submarines, so it was marvelous. They could stick a periscope up and you could pick it up. And the, the aircraft had a very, very tall uh, tower. 
and our, our search radar was there, we could reach them out, uh, well, I'll just say 100 miles or so. And that, that's a blessing to know that no one's going to slip in closer if, if the people looking at the screen knew what they were looking at. Now, you just saw a mark, and, and it was my, one of my jobs to teach them when they looked at it. Was it a surface vessel? Was it an aircraft? Or just what was it? Because there's no picture, you know, it's just a little blip mark on your, on your screen. That was, that was the beginning of television, probably, right there. Because you could put marks on and you could interpret them. It was, it was, it was uh, the most interesting time. I, I feel like the, the necessity, if, the, if you please, the necessity of having to do these things and do these things so that you could have communication, you could have search, you could pick up distant things so that an aircraft could, could home in on a target and, and come back and how many lives it saved. I, I just sort of feel like the electronics part played a very, very huge part in the whole And today we are experiencing uh, modern developments in solid state devices just tremendous. And it all started back, I think, with, uh, with some of the things that they did for military purposes. So there's not always the darkest side. Some of the things that we come out, the good things, I tell you, um, Americans and, uh, and the English and, of course, the Germans and the Japanese, they were all, when they started uh, working on things that were going to mean difference in life and death and saving and winning and losing, you really got with it. It's a strong motivator. I guess I have two questions to, to leave you with. Um, can you tell me about your connection to the Northeast Georgia, Oconee County area. Um, um, did you live here before the war? Did you move here after the war? Uh, yes, I, I'm, I lived in Athens uh, and I worked at the university uh, for a while. And then as soon as I could, I moved into Oconee County. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful area, a very pleasant, spacious, beautiful. Uh, the people are, are so friendly. They, they're, they're really, a hundred percent folks uh, and that, that that attracted me at first I moved as early as I could mm -hmm. let see I moved in 1958 along in the 56 58 I came to Oconee County and so I, I have enjoyed the pleasures of this place for that long and I enjoy the well across the street from where I live the Friendship Presbyterian Church I, I'm a Methodist but Friendship Presbyterian sits up on a hill steeple going towards the heaven and it really inspires you and they have a light on it at night and and the, all the tourists that go by there see it now that's that kind of it appeals to you and uh, of course the Oconee schools were I thought good all along very good and and they're very good now and so I, I did work some with schools different ones with the principals and I was chairman of school board out here for eight years and I worked quite a lot with the schools at that time and superintendent and others and I think we made a lot of progress. We started some new buildings and and if you if you look around and you count the the value of the of the wonderful school facilities that we have, plus the relatively small classes compared to some, uh, it's a marvelous place to live and it's a very attractive and the people are seeing a quality of life that they want to enjoy, different from if they lived in another area. And there is an extra quality here. There's a little more close friendship a little more smiles and a little more pleasures and you don't feel quite as crowded or pushed and there's swimming pools and golf courses and tennis courts and good schools and and adequate uh, adequate facilities the shopping is a little slow <laughs> i have one question uh, i'll leave you with before uh, you go to your church meeting um if you were talking to um, a crop of children now, or, or teenagers, or college students, about the World War II era. What would you leave them with about that time in history, about your experience, or your feeling? Well, I, w I would let them know that we weren't always secure. As a matter of fact, other people had designs on some of the things that we had that they wanted. And we were we were leading along, but it was necessary that we have this conflict to 
to get people's values in the proper place. Our values were different from the values of the other, I will say, the, the German and the Japanese, because when you think of some things that went on in that area, in that country, and some things that the Japanese were doing, it was not our, it was not our human attitude to go in that direction. And it did look like it was inevitable that we should join with the British, the English, uh, Allied. They did a great deal for us, and, and they were very solid all along. So we, we were looking at a different religious, cultural, personal attitude, values, family values. We put values in places that seemed to matter. More, and that's the way I see it still. I, I wouldn't change our values for any of the others. And so that was what it was all about, when you get right down to it. We didn't want to let that go on in other countries as well as it was, would eventually have come here had we not done something. And the Canadians, we're all here with them, and, and they're wonderful people. Uh, we had one or two with us. Um, the different ones would visit on the ship. They're always wonderful people. I think they have a positive influence on us, too. We seem to get along quite well. The United States and Canada, no problems. It doesn't seem to be. And other nations have arguments across the borders, but not us. So I believe we got something different. Well, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Enjoy talking with you.